Hey, 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 everybody. Welcome to the event, the webinar. <laughs> uh, we've got a fantastic amount of content that we're going to be sharing with you today. Sorry for the delay here. I had a bit of a uh, uh, technical difficulties, but we're incredibly excited to have everybody here today. Uh, today, we're going to talk about navigating Black Friday and COVID-19. And uh, I'll tell you who we've got here in a second, but I'm really excited about what we're going to be talking about today. So, you know, let me just get my screen all set up. And in the meantime, please introduce yourselves in the chat. Let us know uh, who you are, where you're logged in from, and let's get this started. So let me share my screen. Boom. There we go. All right. Let's make this big. Cool. So hoping everybody can see the screen pretty well here. Um, you know, I'm just going to get started just by talking about who I am. <laughs> My name is Mike King. I'm the founder and managing director here at iPoll Rank. And if you're tuned in, you likely already know who I am and what I do. Uh, suffice to say that I work on a lot of enterprise brands and, you know, some venture back startups and a lot of mid market brands as well. And we've done a lot in uh, the holiday marketing stuff in the SEO side. And with me today, uh, Raj, if you'd like to introduce yourself, I think the people would appreciate hearing from you. Yeah, happy to. So first of all, like this is a dream come true to be able to do this with you, Mike. Uh, I know we've known each other a lot of time. Uh, excited to do this. Uh, my name is Raj. Um, so I run uh, marketing at a startup called Yatta, which is an e-commerce marketing platform for direct-to-consumer brands like Patagonia, Gymshark, Glossier, a whole host of uh, e-commerce brands and uh, uh, even bigger brands like Steve Madden. Uh, and we basically do everything that uh, the e-commerce brand needs to succeed, like reviews and ratings, loyalty programs, referral programs, SMS, and a whole lot more. Yeah, and I want to talk a bit about Yapo um, further on in the, in the slides when we get to a discussion about reviews and so on. But I think the platform is pretty much a must-have for a lot of the e-commerce brands that are out there. So I'm excited to have you, excited to talk about you know, the subject today. So as far as our agenda, uh, you know, it's what I want to talk about is what is Black Friday gonna look like in terms of COVID-19? Who's gonna dominate like based on what we're seeing already? And then what preparation should you be taking from an organic marketing perspective and also a paid marketing perspective to some degree as well? And then based on all of that stuff that we identify, I wanna also talk about um, what the landscape looks like going into the future. So first, what's it going to look like going into COVID-19? You know, we've had a lot of consumer changes in the last, I don't know, six or so months, especially here in the U.S. Um, but from what we know about the, the past, I can expect that going into the future, we're going to see brands going into the, the holiday season even earlier than they did uh, in previous years. So in, in 07, we saw uh, a 5 a.m. Black Friday that started on the day. In um, 2012, we saw a 10 p.m. Uh, Black Friday that started on Thanksgiving Day. 2018, we saw it happen at 6 p.m. on Thanksgiving. So, you know, you can only expect that brands are going to look to get the jump even more. And so what we, we are seeing is like Amazon, they moved Prime Day to be in October this year. So in, in some ways, they're kind of jumping over everybody by getting started a whole month earlier. Another thing to know is that a lot of stores are just not really opening their physical locations on Thanksgiving because there are a lot of concerns around social distancing and so on, and they're scared of what's going to happen with the crowds. So, you know, some of these stores are still going to open on actual Black Friday, but I think that with the shift to everyone buying so much stuff online as of late, you know, it, it's just not going to be that crowded. Um, Raj, you have any thoughts on Black Friday as far as like what people are doing in person or what you think they're going to do? Yeah, I think A, it's going to start much earlier. Uh, I call almost call it the pumpkin spice latte phenomenon. Like, uh, you know, <laughs> pumpkin spice lattes keep jumping out earlier and earlier and mm -hmm. earlier. And this year mm -hmm. it was actually, it broke a record again by being another day earlier. So you're definitely going to see that. Uh, I think when it comes to crowds, uh, 
And uh, you know, specifically some logos you put up, um, like like Best Buy uh, and a few other uh, uh, big big box stores. You know, they're they're starting to run out of stock uh, because just the work from home phenomenon has driven so much uh, demand that a lot of people are now going to the stores because they're out on their e-commerce distribution centers. So it's a chance for uh, brands to show off their offline presence as much as it's online. Because I think a lot of it's just driven by the sheer fact that there's so much demand and I'm not sure if online can keep up with a lot of that. And uh, stores have almost become like fulfillment centers. Yeah, absolutely. When we, when we did a webinar a couple months back, it was called marketing in the age of COVID-19. And one of the things that we did is we examined that whole idea of supply chain and how you know COVID-19 starting in China um, was going to just break down everybody's su supply chain in a lot of ways. And so you know we've we've seen how so many products are just not available and like things like weights as an example. You know, uh, for a long time it was just like a, a an outage of weights, and we're starting to see things like that come back now that, you know, China is reopened, it is pretty much back at full steam. But at the same time, like you said, that demand just completely outweighs supply because there's just so many things that people, you know, weren't buying before. Like if you think about things like bikes that are completely out of stock, like I got a bike for my birthday, it's not here yet, you know? Um, and so people needing to, do things like exercise at, at home and so on. That demand just so outweighs supply. And I suspect that you're absolutely right here. So looking at the popularity of Black Friday, you know, just in terms of what that search demand looks like, um, we saw a slight dip last year in that in that popularity. But I think, you know, just generally speaking, being that people are so um, so so used to buying things online, those Black Friday deals just aren't as good. You know, I, I, I couldn't imagine myself, and I recognize I'm saying this from a position of privilege, but I couldn't imagine myself waiting in line at 5 a.m. to get a TV. You know, you can order, you can get a better deal online any day than you're gonna get uh, for most Black Friday deals. But, you know, despite all that, we're seeing that more people are going to be looking, obviously, for more deals coming into this. And the interesting thing is that uh, Cyber Monday also dropped a little bit as well. But there's been this continual uh, debate as to which one is better. You know, which one of these do we actually account for as online e-commerce brands? And I'm actually curious what you think about that, Raj. You know, like which which of these days actually works better for e-commerce sites, or is it just that? we continue to optimize for both expecting that there's going to be you know multiple pops in that weekend so you got yeah. Black friday small business saturday cyber monday like how do you think that brand should be thinking about this i think so what we're recommending to all of our brands that we work with there's like thousands of them uh, what we're telling them and what we're seeing from our surveys and customer just behavior is that customers are or consumers and shoppers whatever you want to call them are switching brands at a very unprecedented pace. Mm -hmm. So there's no such thing as brand loyalty anymore. If something's out of stock, they'll go find it somewhere else, which yeah. is frankly good news. If you are at a brand that is not like, you know, a huge brand, you now have an opportunity to work with somebody like Mike to make sure that, you know, your products are showing up in stock on Google, in stock on uh, local searches, in stock on, they're marked up on your website, right? With the right type of, uh, in stock type of verbiage and uh, syntax. I think what we're seeing is that a lot of brands are starting to advertise already. Uh, they're not waiting for the actual Labor Day to happen. Uh, they started early or Labor Day or Black Friday. They're starting to just get out there and build the uh, basically uh, top of mind, but they're also saying get it while it's in stock. Um, so the ones that have things in stock, they're like advertising on Instagram, they're advertising on Facebook. Uh, and Google to a certain extent, but they're they're using that verbiage that it's in stock now. You can get it by X. Uh, that's become a big hook for a lot of brands who might not be huge like a Best Buy, but they can get somebody to switch because they're looking for something right now. Absolutely, I think it, it's like wide open for anybody at this point. You know, it's not just about am I going to go buy this from like you said Best Buy or Amazon. 
because so many of those sites have been out of stock for so long and people are more open to taking the chance on the drop shipper based in Indonesia that they don't know about and things like that. And so for some of these bigger brands though, they're just like, okay, the game plan is like just maximize digital period. Like we don't care about, you know, what day it is, because if you think about it, a lot of these brands previously, even if they were doing cyber Monday last week, last year, it was a full week too. They were like, okay, now it's cyber week. Um, my only concern, and maybe it's not a real concern, but my only concern, as a consumer is like, if I saw the deal was X on Black Friday, and then now it's even better, it was Y on Cyber Monday, well, why should I buy it right away? I wonder if that urgency um, is something that people aren't really having because they're like, well, it's gonna be an even better sale, but it's also kind of couched with this idea that people are gonna run out of stock very quickly as well. So maybe the two forces end up working together in that way. But despite that, last year, we also saw that um, Cyber Monday was much bigger than Black Friday as far as e-commerce sales. So, you know, it, it seems like a lot of people were um, still going back online to see what type of deal they could get on that next day. But I, I really think this is going to flip flop a bit uh, because of the fact that, you know, people are just like we we're just discussing really mindful of the supply chain issues and they want to make sure that they get those gifts as soon as they can. So online shopping, of course, has been really explosive in the last, you know, few months and so on and, and last year, of course. But uh, I think it's really interesting to really think about this idea, like, is Cyber Monday really going to dethrone Black Friday? I don't think it's it's I don't think that's true. I think it's going to flip flop the other way. But like we're we're saying here, these sales are just going to continue to start earlier. So key things to know. And and um, Raj, I'm really curious to see what your thoughts are here. But the data is really just suggesting, like you know, mobile friendly. You have to absolutely be there. Um, so many brands waited for so long. Google's been pushing us for so long to be mobile friendly. Uh, you know, I just, I'm just curious what you're seeing on your side at Yapo on mobile adoption. Is it a foregone conclusion or is it the type of thing we're still trying to like bring brands into the future? Yeah, uh, I think what we're seeing and, you know, this is be a cliche, everybody used to say, if you're not mobile, if you got to get on mobile, I think if you're not like optimized for mobile, like you're going to go out of business basically. <laughs> uh, you know, and that's just, that's the truth because COVID has changed everything. And for us, like we're looking at consumer behavior, how people are shopping, 80, 90% of traffic and orders are not coming from mobile. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, that's the reality. And it's not going to go back anytime soon. The spikes that we're seeing are, are sustainable. Uh, and so basically, like if you're not optimized for mobile, you don't have a great presence uh, to be able to, you know, browse, uh, put it in the cart, check out fast. Uh, you know, you're kind of wasting a lot of dollars doing all this data advertising, SEO work that you're doing, and then you're not optimized for mobile because people are on the go. And I call them the everywhere shopper. Mm -hmm. so shop where they are. They don't care like what your channel looks like, what this looks like. They want to be able to maybe add to cart on their laptop and check out on their phone when they're ready. Yeah. And that's, that's the reality of right now. The consumer is totally channel agnostic. They will want to shop where they are, wherever they are, however they are. I agree. I agree. So the next question that really comes up is how's unemployment going to affect all of this? And so, you know, there's no way to truly predict this. Um, but if we look at the 2008 crisis, we did see that there was a 4.6% drop in total online and in-store spending um, around the Black Friday holiday. So you know, it, it's it's really hard to determine if that's what we're going to see now, because you could still go outside <laughs> during the uh, 2008 financial crisis, and it wasn't like such a dramatic shift towards you know that change in consumer behavior. Um, and also, just if we're talking a lot about people not having the money, well, of course they're going to look for the deals. So I suspect that we're not going to see the same drop. And in fact, we may even see uh, an increase this year. 
And, you know, that's just speculation. I'm, it's, it's hard to really know. But I think that it's just not the same. We're not comparing apples to apples here. So interestingly, if we look at uh, Shopify's data, they're seeing more than Black Friday levels of, of spend on a daily basis. And I think this is actually really interesting because, you know, if, if you're if you're in e-commerce, if you're in retail, period, um, that is your time to shine. Like it's really Black Friday, Cyber Monday, um, and if you're a small business, small business Saturday and all that. And then through the end of the year, uh, after the holidays tend to be your biggest seasons. And then there's that big drop off in January and things don't really come back, depending on your space, but things don't really come back until about April. So it's really interesting to see that their, their common or their daily usage or sales and so on across the Shopify network is so high at this point. I'm just curious of what you guys are seeing on the Yapo side, Raj. I mean, all what we're seeing is just explosive growth. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've seen adoption of e-commerce in eight eight weeks or like two months that was supposed to happen in four to five years. Mm -hmm. uh, so even though overall retail might be slightly down, e-commerce is at like a triple digit uh, growth curve. And that means, you know, are you now, let's say if you have a product, let's just be product specific. Is that product on your own store is it showing up on Google? Is it also being advertised on Instagram and Facebook? Or have you marked it up the right way to show up in search results? Do you have the right description? Is it consistent across all those? Uh, is it in a marketplace like Walmart's marketplace or uh, other marketplaces that are present? Because Shopify gives you this amazing ability to syndicate your product data as well. So I think it's, it's, the world has drastically changed in the last few months. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we're seeing in e-commerce is just explosive growth. And there's categories like if you're in home, if you're in pets, babies, uh, if you're in uh, you know beauty, uh, these are like just they're exploding, absolutely exploding. And uh, we're just seeing a lot of uh, just a lot of business coming our way uh, mm -hmm. from these types of categories. That's awesome. So despite all that growth that we're all seeing, we're all kind of anticipating. We're seeing some of these uh you know market research companies uh are predicting that there's going to be some a, a decrease in uh black friday spending and again i don't it's hard to say what it's going to be but they're predicting a 7.5 percent decrease so with all that said let's let's jump into who we're believing is going to down up and i think you know we all have to always talk about the elephant in the room when we're talking about e-commerce uh, Amazon, of course, is on a hot streak. If you haven't bought your Amazon stock, you probably should. Uh, they're going to continue to win, as you can tell. But at the same time, they're obviously not going to compete. So if we compare them to you know, eBay, Walmart, Target, Etsy, and so on, can, clearly they're, they're at the top. But at the same time, all those other sites are continuing to grow as well. And if we look at Amazon Prime Day sales, you know, they continue to grow at an exponential rate. And that's why I say that Amazon moving Prime Day to being October this year is really them getting a jump on that holiday season rather than, you know, kind of wasting it by having it be earlier in the year. So again, if we then start shifting and looking at the global e-commerce marketplace, and you know we're we're not we're not looking at every small little uh, e-commerce brand that exists, but if we're looking at some of the smaller ones as compared to um, you know the Amazons of the world and so on, we're also seeing dramatic increases there. Looking at eBay, uh, they they saw a bit of a dip at the top of the year, but then they saw everything just come back to life pretty uh, effectively. You look at Etsy. They've seen exponential growth. I mean, this is all year over year, of course, but looking at this year specifically. And then if you look at Target, we're seeing you know, dramatic growth there too. So the reality of it is that the winners are gonna keep winning, but to the points that we've been making throughout this discussion, um, there's opportunity for everybody because things are in such disarray from a supply chain perspective. And another huge opportunity, and, and you know, again, I'm curious to see uh, what you guys are seeing on the Yapo side, but a huge opportunity is this same day service, also this 
curbside pickup stuff. Like this is a dramatic shift in how um, the in-store experience is going as well. So just curious if there's what what you guys are seeing across the uh, Yapo environment. Yep. You, I mean, this is absolutely this is absolutely true, right? Of course, people are discovering that they can buy a lot of the stuff that they would go to the stores for, even mm -hmm. grocery items, right? CPG items, they would just go pick them up at a store. Well, now they've trained themselves, and once once these habits form, they're very hard to break. So what's happening is they've, they've trained themselves to buy these CPG items even online, and now what's happening is that they're figuring out a way to build subscriptions. So they don't have to keep reordering them online. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're seeing the advent of a lot of subscription models from even like, you know, Heinz now has a direct to consumer website, right? Uh, a lot Pepsi has a bunch of brands that have direct to consumer websites. And a lot of them are geared towards building subscriptions. So you can get like a package of 10 delivered X amount of time, maybe a month, a quarter, things like that. Um, so yeah, I think what, what we're seeing is that a lot of items that you would never thought of buying online have gone online. People are buying them. And now the next level to that, what we're seeing is that they're building subscription models uh, to be able to just get them without having to them. Yeah, and that, that's a great point. You know, even Amazon has that as well. Um, but it, it, D2C is, is obviously like the other big trend that's happening at the same time with all of this. And it makes sense for these brands. Like why go through these other channels, these other distribution networks, if you can maximize it this way. And the technology is just so easy to get set up on these types of things. You know, big brands using Shopify Plus and, and what have you. It's just a really simple plug and play way to do this. Um, so yeah, I, I definitely agree, obviously, because it's what's happening in real life. But um, yeah, I think it's really cool to watch this shift, both from a consumer perspective and uh supplier perspective and then just to like cap this off you know paypal is of course seeing dramatic growth as well um really interesting in that that kind of indicates that not only are these big people growing but these smaller uh you know mom and pop e-commerce sites have a lot of opportunity as well and they're capitalizing on it so how do we prepare for all this like what should you actually do to capitalize on these things. Well, one, you want to keep that COVID-19 response front and center. Um, people want to make sure that your brand is keeping them safe. Uh, make sure that you know you guys are taking the right precautions when you're packing up the goods and sending them out to them. So keeping all that stuff front and center, even though everyone is bored of uh, COVID-19 content, I think it's like the, the new trust signal. Like it's the same as having HTTPS or having, you know, the VeriSign logo or something like that. It's just something that you have to have in your content so that people know that you are, you know, reactive to this stuff. Other thing is start planning early. You know, if you're, if you're just now thinking about Black Friday for SEO, it's probably too late. Um, and that's not an absolute statement, but it can be too late. So if you're going into this from an SEO perspective, a key thing that you should not be doing is killing your link equity. It's very common for merchandising teams or marketing teams to spin up a series of Black Friday pages and then get rid of them as soon as Black Friday is over. It's much better for you to have just a standard URL like you know, brand.com slash Black Friday and keep that page up and continue to add content over on it uh, year over year, you know, updating the page titles, meta descriptions, and so on, um, and also just indicating that you know it's not Black Friday right now. So that way, that page will continue to maximize its link equity. It'll continue to rank, and so when Black Friday comes around the next year, you're already ranking for it. Um, this is a good example of what Walmart has here. They have their Black Friday page from last year still up, despite the fact that the URL is Black Friday 2019. You'll see that the, the copy on the page is referring to Black Friday 2020 so that they can already rank for that stuff uh, as they go into that new year. So they can you know, either just throw and redirect this later or change the copy and keep it moving. Uh, Best Buy does an even better job in that they have a more evergreen Black Friday page. And this page ranks number two for Black Friday deals. 
So they've already updated this copy to reflect Black Friday 2020, and they're already getting the jump on that type of uh, ranking. And then creating seasonal content, super valuable. You know, if you're a merchandising team, this is probably what you're already thinking about. Uh, you know, what are the specific things that we're highlighting for uh, the holidays? What are the things that we're trying to you know sell? Uh, segmenting this based on different types of people that you might be buying for and things like that, and then just optimizing that accordingly for the right keywords associated with the holiday season. And then this is where I'm going to hand it off to you, uh, Raj. Really highlighting reviews super valuable. We saw in a recent study from Search Engine Journal that it is one of the most influential things that leads to people actually uh, buying something. And so we, we can't really say enough about the value of reviews. And so, you know, to that point, Raj, I think it would be great for you to just tell us a, a bit more about the reviews product that Yapo offers. Yeah, so I think Yapo was uh, it started off as a reviews provider, right? And the platform over time has uh, continued to grow to provide more organic uh, growth drivers. Uh, but it's a tried and true, right? If you have an online business, uh, you don't want somebody going and finding ten people to tell them like what to do, like should I buy this, should I not buy this? So crowdsourcing uh, feedback is one of the easiest ways to build social proof, is what we call it. And social proof is exactly what you do, right? You ask friends, you ask family, you'll post in a Facebook group, you'll post on Instagram, like, you know, should I buy this, should I not buy this? And this is an easy way uh, just to learn uh, from uh, other people who are either buying or experiencing those products and services. And this is, you know, the, again, nothing groundbreaking here. People trust reviews. Uh, people, uh, and especially like the page you're showing at Amazon, there's 455,000 ratings for that particular product. And I can tell you there's no way to gain 455,000 ratings. Uh, and at some point, the truth will come out. Um, you know, we, we use it as twofold. One is to educate your consumer or the shopper about the product. And B is also learn as a brand and a business about where you need to make changes, but then also where are adjacent or tangential ways of making more money. Right, if somebody's like, oh, I wish I could get this on a subscription and a review, that's enough. That's like a light bulb for you to go like, oh my God, I could be actually offering this as a subscription and now I can get recurring revenue. Yeah. So review and, really have themselves to that. Yeah, and then there's also the opportunities for standing out in search. Yep. And uh, you know, we are uh, very lucky to be working with Google and if you haven't checked out Google's commerce, uh, I call it resurgence lately. They've made it free for you to list your products. Uh, they've also made uh, made it free for you to like uh, take the feed and use it. If you use Shopify or something, there's connectors already in their app store. Uh, so it's a great way to syndicate and get more eyes on your products. And uh, Google also offers a thing called Google Seller Ratings, where your brand can now, like Steve Madden here, actually shows up as a 4.7 uh, rating out of five as a brand. Right, so it's a great way to show off. Uh, the rating for your brand, rating for your products, and then, uh, you know, if you're showing a social proof, right, like Steve Madden does here, this is this is directly from Steve Madden. Just by putting these reviews in, putting the topics in, and making it very transparent, they saw 166 uh, percent uplift in their on-site conversion rate. Again, if you're doing all this SEO, all these paid ads, you want your site to be able to perform so that you're not leaving money on the table. So reviews are one of the easiest ways uh, to be able to build social proof and say basically to the shopper that this is for you. Because ultimately when I want to buy something, I want to know that it's for me. Yeah, and to that point, you know, one of the, the bigger problems with e-commerce content is like you've got hundreds of thousands or millions of product pages. How do you differentiate this content when you've got you know, um, you're just using like OEM descriptions and so on. How do you actually make this not duplicate content? And reviews are a great way to do it and it's user generated. So it's not something that you specifically have to put too much effort into. You know, you just gotta scope the users to actually do it. And then that way you're able to further optimize these pages without having to have a copyright and write more for every single page. And then that also yields a lot of insights that you can, you know, use things like natural language processing to pull out. And also there's just a lot of data that you've got here 
and yeah. got the platform and then yeah, you got the cool platform. thing is oh. you can filter by topic right you can filter by quality comfort fit mm -hmm. and then and mike you hit the nail on the head and a lot of people don't actually do this so if you want to stand out from your competition use reviews to update copy product descriptions make that take snippets of reviews and put it in quotes like best reviewed this is what happened right so these are like keywords that they're just giving you because that's how people talk yeah cool and that's how they search <laughs> cool so yeah i mean check out yapo it seems to be a, a great solution for this type of stuff so next thing you just want to make sure that your products are available um you know obviously if you're trying to sell things make sure the things that rank are the things that are available and you can support that with your internal linking structure so like let's say for instance you've got um two different products that are the same thing and you've got one that's ranking really well, but that product's not available. Well, that may yield what are called soft 404s uh, because of how Google is determining what a soft 404 is. So I've seen a lot of instances where clients uh, have had out of stock products that trigger soft 404s and then those pages will either not rank or fall out of the index. And so what you would wanna do is, is point your link equity throughout the site to the page that does actually uh, have an in-stock product so that you're not losing out because of your product just being out of stock. And if you're a last minute person, the really the only viable last minute tactic as far as link building is gonna be page and domain acquisition and then 301 in those. So that's a, a strategy that we've used a number of times. In fact, we had a client, this was a couple of years ago, um, they were in the greeting card space and they had been building links in a, a pretty uh, nefarious way in, in the eyes of Google. And so for the keyword, I think it was uh, Christmas cards, they were bouncing around in the SERP. So they were ranking like lower than 100, they would rank 50, then they wouldn't rank at all. And you know, previously they ranked very well because they had bought links and so on. And so we did a whole like backlink audit. We also uh, identify some domains that we could buy and redirect to these pages. And they ended up at ranking at number four going into the holiday season. So, you know, this is one of the one ways that you can, one of the one, it's like the only way that you can really get quick rankings. And uh, Ryan Stewart put out a video about this recently where he showed where he did it in a way where they were just buying pages from websites, putting the page that they bought onto their website and then having the old website 301 only that page and he saw uh, increases in traffic and rankings from that. So it doesn't have to be a full domain, it can be on the page level as well. And the other thing is that you don't wanna underestimate the power of technical SEO as you go into the holiday season. And here's just a quick case study of a, a large e-commerce site that we worked on um, that we grew the revenue incrementally in the Black Friday holiday season, $25 million. And so, you know, a lot of it was just that technical SEO, us doing the audit, digging in and determining, you know, like the, the, the blocking and tackling problems to fix, things like internal link redirects and uh, uh, broken URLs and, and canonical tags and things of that nature. And it yielded, you know, a, a net increase of 24% in transactions, 34% uh, in organic search revenue, and then 30% in organic search uh, sessions. So really, don't forget like those things you've had in your roadmap all year that keep getting pushed off, they're incredibly valuable. And again, to this idea of generating copy on the category layer, you know, if you can't get um, or you don't have reviews going into this, there are so many tools out there now for text generation. So you may have heard of GPT-3, um, I wrote a blog post about GPT-2. There's a tool called InferKit, which you're seeing on your screen, which will do this without you needing code, like you can just use their API. Bottom line is that there's no reason for you not to have copy that's relevant on your pages. Uh, and to that point, like I said, I've got a blog post on it. Uh, Raj, I'm actually kind of curious with respect to, if you know about the SEO programs or some of the clients you guys work with, um, some of your smaller sites, how are they focusing? Like, are they focusing more on the long tail? Are they focusing more on branded queries? Do you just have any insight on that? Yeah, I think it really depends on the size of the business. It also depends on the catalog size. 
Mm -hmm. uh, so usually if they are smaller, the catalog is very also limited. So they're, you know, they're trying to not compete with, you know, like the best buys in the world by saying mm -hmm. widescreen monitor. <laughs> so, you know, you have to find basically a niche long tail type of keyword or key phrase. Uh, and at the same time, you know, find a balance between paid and organic. Uh, and in the e-commerce world, yeah, you can start with Instagram ads. You can get a, some somewhat of a top line growth, but then you don't get the margin that you get with SEO and all those other things kicking in, right? So if you want to have a sustainable business, like one of the biggest mantras, like we tell our customers is like, yes, paid ads are great, but if you want to really make money and be profitable over time, you have to do these things that like you were showing that uh, case study and I'm like nodding like a crazy person with technical SEO is just like, you know, even just your own site, like have you looked at like what's being blocked for two robots? It's just like, it sounds silly, but it's uh, over time, these things happen. So our, our biggest mantra is, you know, we don't get into paid or organic or anything like this. Like we just do reviews and loyalty and a bunch of other stuff. But, you know, these are like fundamental things that you have to, address and usually like from a smaller site it's, it's long tail and for the bigger sites you know it's, it's really owning uh you know whatever if it's like steve bannett's platform shoes you know how do you build content around it now how do you build links around it now right because they have a bigger budget uh so you see them investing a lot more in google uh after they reach they're usually like 50 to 100 million mm -hmm. uh in sales you see a lot more investment in google rather than instagram and facebook yeah, that makes sense. And yeah, I mean, I think the key point here is just that if you're a smaller shop, you definitely need to focus more on the long tail. And then as you grow that revenue, you can grow into uh, the head terms and so on. But especially during the holiday season, all these keywords get way more competitive. And so if you're just now ramping up, you're going to have to focus more on that longer tail. Um, and so to the point of content, and I think, uh, you know, Raj was just uh, you know alluding to this this idea of creating content around like these topical clusters. So creating your pillar content and creating all the content that goes with that. So it's not just like the platform shoes. It's like, where do you wear the platform shoes? How do you clean the platform shoes? You got to like have the whole ecosystem. And so a, a good way to identify that at scale is by using Google's uh, people also ask. And so you can use a tool like a SERP API, you put in your core query, and then it'll also have the data uh, that you can extract around what questions are being asked and people also ask. But the other thing is that in creating this content, your keywords have keywords. And I've been talking about this concept of technical content optimization for the last couple of years. And really what that is, is like, how do you account for the topics that Google expects? How do you account, account for the co-occurring keywords that Google expects. And I think answering these questions is a good way to start, but there's also a variety of tools out there that really help you do this. So whether it's the SEM Rush Writing Assistant or Search Metrics' content, content experience or Market Muse or Writes Content Success or Phrase, all of these tools have a different flavor of this idea of understanding the statistical expectations that search engines have around content and then telling you, hey, you're not using these ideas enough in your content. And then when you do that, you see increases in rankings pretty much right away. And so if we're talking about getting into the holiday season and maximizing it, figure out what those key opportunities are for your brand and do this effort, whether it's on that category layer, on that product detail page layer, or even in your editorial content layer, so you can get some opportunity out of that pretty much right away. And then the next thing, you know, just from a tactical SEO perspective, or last thing really, is just the internal linking structure. I cannot drive this home enough. You know, I've been saying this one for years as well. Uh, there's just so much valuable value, rather, for a e-commerce site in the internal linking structure. And there's been plenty of like tests out there, A/B tests, and so on, where different websites have done things where they identify the sweet spot and the number of internal links you can build to a page such that it impacts its rankings in Google itself. Um, Dennis G, uh, who's over at, where's Dennis at these days? He's at PayPal. Um, used to be at Airbnb, Previous prior to that he was at eBay. And when he was at eBay, he basically, his whole team derived this mechanism where if a page ranked 
on page two in Google, they would build a number of internal links to that page and then it would pop up in the rankings in Google. He has a great blog post about that. But also Kevin Inde has like the most robust posts on internal linking I've ever seen. So I would encourage you to uh, check that out. So beyond the SEO stuff, you know, I, I think there's just like some uh, tactical and strategic marketing things that you need, need to do to be more effective here. And again, I think this is a good place to get an understanding of, you know, how uh, Yapo is supporting this type of stuff. But it seems like there's a lot of value uh, in highlighting your sales even more. And I know you guys do like the offers and the SMS stuff. So just give us a sense of like ways that people use the platform to highlight the sales even more. Yeah, I think there's a to go back to like what you said, you know, there's two types of questions people ask. They mm -hmm. ask the question previous to the sale and they ask questions for after the sale. I'll give you an example. Like I bought Allbirds and I'm like, I was asking questions like, are they washable? And then when I got them, I'm like, well, how do I not wash them? Mm -hmm. And this is just like, you know, opportunity for publishers too that offer content uh, on basically answering these questions. But ultimately, we're all just answering, asking questions that we can give the answers to. I think for us, like on the other side, with um, post purchase, pre purchase, uh, with SMS having acquired SMS Bump uh, this year, we are creating a whole new channel, uh, which is basically SMS marketing. And uh, if you think about SMS marketing, it's 98% open rate. Wow. I mean, that just like blows away any other channel when it comes to open rates. Mm -hmm. now, obviously, there's like an opt-in involved, things like that. But what we're seeing is some of the clever brands right now, they are saying on Instagram and Google and all these other places, do you want extra special Black Friday specials? Sign up for our SMS. Uh, on the day of, day before, and we'll let you know as a very exclusive VIP member, mm -hmm. right? And then they follow it up with like, now that you're a loyal VIP member, here's more stuff for you. And it's always not just coupons. It's always, you know, like tiers you can offer. Or, or you know, you can offer if you want to get higher EOV and not just offer crazy discounts that often 20% off, you can say hey, everything above $100 is 50% off mm -hmm. if you sign up for SMS. Right, so there's lots of ways to play around uh, with average order value because that matters a lot in e-commerce. Mm -hmm. uh, and then use channels like SMS, channels like loyalty for pre and post purchase. Yeah, great. Um, and yeah, I think you, you were making this point earlier, but this idea of the interplay between paid and you know your organic channels and so on. Um, I, I'll tell you a quick story. You know, I I over index on organic in general. And so I bought an e-commerce site a couple of years ago and I was just all in on the organic stuff. And it didn't go well because, you know, obviously you've got to in the beginning get your sales up, right? You like you can't wait for organic to work out. And ultimately what I realized is that our best channel was Google Shopping, like as far as conversion rate and you know it, it was the the step function of growth. But because I spent so much time on the organic side, you know, we weren't able to get the traction as fast as I would want to. So um, as you were saying, you know, it seems like brands are starting out with the with the uh, Instagram ads, the Facebook ads and so on, and then shifting over towards Google and so on. So just say a bit more about that and you know what that interplay might look like from an organic perspective. Yeah, I think what we're seeing is uh, we did this study about a year ago. We call it the direct-to-consumer state of industry. And basically, we did it by size of business. Mm -hmm. And we could see how businesses or brand marketers and businesses were uh, basically behaving, where they put their money when they were small, where mm -hmm. they put their money when they were medium, and then where they put their money as they grew larger. Right? So we were seeing uh, at the very small end, there was a lot of, you know, uh, optimization for like community building at first, Instagram, uh, getting just like that proof point. And as they got the proof point, you know, they got to like 5 million, 10 million. Then they start to evolve and they're like, okay, now we can find new channels for growth. Mm -hmm. Then you start seeing more Facebook, then they start dabbling more in Google. Uh, but one thing they, they definitely did is they got the fundamentals right, which is like, you know, making sure like the index is good, the product descriptions are good, but you know, the pictures are visceral and visual. Like mm -hmm. those are like 
I, I get that that's SEO, but to me, that's just like, I would expect that. Um, so make sure like everything's beautiful, everything's great. And then graduate into, you know, then you'd see like, as they get into 50, 100 million, they start dabbling into TV, they start dabbling with Google Shopping. Uh, but even if you do TV, what do you point them back to? Do you point them back to some campaign you're doing on SMS? Mm -hmm. Do you point it back to like, you know, sign up here for X? Uh, there's lots of clever ways to use all these different channels to, I, I you know, I would think to bring them back to your most profitable channel uh, because you've spent so much money building that initial wave. Everything following that has to focus on margins uh, because you don't want to be a hundred million dollar brand spending 80 million on X. Yeah. And I think it's really interesting because, you know, a lot of brands have pulled back their spins, especially in paid search. And so it, it's hard to say how this is going to change. Like, obviously, it's going to increase as far as like CPCs and so on um, going into Black Friday and so on. But at the same time, I think it's it's still going to be on sale as compared to last year. So um, this is a, a lot of opportunity in paid. And so I just want to not ignore what that opportunity is. And in fact, there's, there's a um, series of uh, webinars that uh, Perna over at uh, Microsoft is going to be giving around like paid stuff, kind of, you know, the, the, the comparable stuff to what we're discussing today. And so I would encourage folks to check that out as well. So that's all the tactical stuff, but I do want to talk a little bit about, you know, what we expect as far as the future of Black Friday moving forward. Uh, I think we're just seeing a lot of permanent you know, consumer behavioral changes, like you kind of mentioned earlier. And so, you know, I definitely think that we're going to continue to see growth in e-commerce going into um, uh, Black Friday in 2021 and 2022. And, you know, all the experts are predicting it as well. But I think it's just, again, just a dramatic shift, like you said, with respect to people now subscribing to things that they used to go to the store for, right? Like, you don't, you don't think like, oh, I got to go to the store to get my um, deodorant anymore. <laughs> You're just like, cool, I'm going to order that from whoever or my makeup or whatever. And so all those base level things that people are like, oh, I go to Dwayne Reed or Walgreens for now become things that you just order. So I think a lot of that stuff is just going to dramatically impact uh, how people are buying online. And then, you know, you just can't ignore the fact that we just saw 10 years of growth in e-commerce in three months. Um, it, it is astounding to see, um, and I, I know you guys are seeing or feeling the the growth on the Apple side. So it's just been crazy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just look at Shopify, right? Just look at the market value of where that company is. Mm -hmm. and how many merchants are signing up on a daily basis? Right. I think a great a great opportunity is that if you are working, if you haven't worked with, you should be working with food and beverage. Uh, they don't have a lot of expertise in going online. They need a lot of help. Uh, and their category is just like on a triple digit growth rate. And that's gonna, that's a sustainable growth rate, uh, cumulative growth rate over the next year. Uh, it'll slow down, but it's just so explosive right now. Yeah, <clears throat> absolutely. And so, you know, the user behaviors has changed. Any number of studies will tell you that, like the study that we ran uh, back in April, you know, people said that about well, 64% of our respondents were saying that they developed new habits that they believe will outlast COVID-19. Um, you know, 68% of consumers are saying that they're buying their essential goods online after COVID-19. And a lot of people, especially in the U.S., are saying that in almost every category where you can buy things, they're buying them online now. And so, you know, just understanding that change in behavior. And this is something that I said when we did this webinar previously, like people were just realizing a lot of stuff that we were doing before was not smart and you can do it online, like grocery delivery. Why would you go to the grocery store unless there's like a specific thing that you want, like, I don't know, a specific piece of produce that you have to go to like a specialty store for. Um, if you can afford it, you definitely would want to get your groceries delivered. And I think a lot more people have given that a try as a result of this. And they're like, hey, why not continue to do this? Um, but shopping for the holidays, we're also seeing a lot more people 
saying like, hey, I'm going to do this online that weren't saying it before. Or they'll, they'll shop and then, you know, pick it up uh, in person and so on. And again, we've seen shifts before. Like we saw that, you know, before the recession, there were more people that were going and spending more money on things like groceries. And then after that or during it, it was less. And so, you know, we're, we're not we're not so removed from a time where things dramatically changed and we can completely expect that we're just living in a whole different world at this point. So yeah, that's all we got. There's some questions that have popped up as well. And if anyone has an additional question, please feel free to either put it in the chat <clears throat> or drop it in the bottom. Um, so I'm gonna start this one for you, Raj. What channels do you think will provide the most impact during cyber shopping season? How do you think it'll be different in COVID weather? Can Santa get COVID? Well, I retired from practicing medicine a few years ago, so I had a bunch of But I think I, I'll, I'll give you two. I mean, Google Shopping, they have just making so much noise right now and i think they are they're they're starting to see the, the insane growth rate in e-commerce and they're becoming your best friend as a merchant uh or as a and i think the new the new adage is that every brand is an online business if you don't have an online business something uh, and i think the other one's sms it's it's starting to now grow it's not the best secret anymore that you know that 98 percent open rates 90% open within three minutes, and you can build another amazing list. And also, there's lots of compliments with email marketing. So I think those two are like I'm very bullish, uh, just because it'll give you a, another leg up if you're looking for it uh, with your business and uh, and great margins too. Cool. All right, next one is is more up your alley too. How are you approaching email and or loyalty strategy this holiday season? Yeah, I think we're, we, uh, we approach it as like a reward strategy and it's like a, a reward for, you know, leaving a review, a reward for uh, liking on Instagram, a reward for actions that your most loyal customers would take. And then, you know, luckily in our platform, you can segment this uh, and you can figure out who are your most loyal customers because if they're taking those actions, you want to put them in like a separate bucket. Right? If somebody actually goes and then likes you and does something on Instagram, like you want to treat them as good. Uh, so like that type of strategy you really need. And that, I think it's a reward strategy built off of not just discounts, but actions that your customers can take. And then referrals is another easy way uh, to uh, basically get people to bring you more money. Uh, especially like I have referred people over to Allbirds because I freaking love the brand. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's brands like this, like you're probably wearing it right now. You're probably thinking about doing something with that brand later on this day. So when you think that people don't do referrals, you're already doing it by wearing it or doing something. Gotcha. All right. So the next one, I'm going to take this one. It says, uh, what are some of the biggest trends and products we foreshadow for Black Friday this year? I know the Nintendo Switch had a lot of buzz beginning of the pandemic. So we actually did some research on this. Um, so there's a lot, right? Like we're seeing more and more people looking for patio and outdoor heaters. NFL merch is coming up pretty um, hot right now. We're seeing for apparel, a lot of companies like Macy's and Bloomingdale's really encouraging those curbside pickups. And then as a result of that, we're seeing you know a lot more activity around that because it seems like for a while people were like, okay, where do I get clothes? Okay, shopping online. Oh, the big brands are now getting back in the game. Uh, I mentioned this earlier, a bike, you know, that is, is going to take a while to get here. People are seeing brands like Schwinn and the Specialized Bikes get a lot of uh, activity as of late, musical instruments. We're seeing a lot of trends around like Fender and Gibson, gym sets, of course, so all like the weights and Pelotons and all that other stuff. Um, picnic baskets, which was surprising to me because, you know, you only go on picnics on cartoons, but it seems like a lot of people... I want to go on picnics because of the fact that things are getting colder or about to get colder. And then we're seeing uh, Lego toy sets, yoga mats, 
uh, brands like Lululemon getting a lot of love, Aloe Yoga as well. Uh, and then, you know, on top of that, just your standard stuff, again, like the Nintendo Switch and the bundles and uh, iPhone 12 and stuff like that. So some of that is just like, you know, standard seasonal stuff, but some of it is also just, you know, a direct reflection of what's happening as a result of the pandemic. So we are at time. Um, you got any final words, Raj? Uh, I would say with everything going on right now, if you're a brand marketer, just be positive. Uh, spread positivity with your message. And uh, you'd be surprised how many shoppers or consumers would appreciate that. Yeah. And uh, we really appreciate having you today. And you know, thanks, everybody, for joining. And we wish you all the best going into Black Friday. And if there's anything that you know, either I or Raj and Yapo can do, please feel free to reach out to us. Uh, you know, it's pretty easy to find me. Raj, how do we find you? Yeah, it's just rajayapo.com. Cool. All right, guys. Thanks so much for joining us. And again, thanks for having or thanks for joining us, uh, Raj. And I'll see you all in the next one. We've got, oh, yeah, we've got a, another webinar coming up. Um, about how to prepare for SEO for 2021 uh, in a couple of weeks. So you'll get an email about that as well. All right. Thank you. Peace.